We're talking to Fran Dusky today about Tony Consiglio's relationship with the great Frank Sinatra. I'm fascinated by this book because you got access to Tony, who was called the clam by oh, Frank because yeah, yeah. he never talked. He was his longtime confidant. Tony has since passed in 2008. That's great. Yeah. So let's talk about how did you gain access and trust with Tony to get Sinatra and me the very good years written? Well, it was actually through the family connection. Uh, in 1938, uh, Tony's mother borrowed $500 and started Sally's Pizza. Uh, and we should say you're a New Haven guy. Oh, I was born in New Haven, yes. Yep. For sure. Uh, and uh, so I was at Sally's Pizza. I, I used to go there quite often, still do. And uh, one Sunday afternoon, uh, Ruthie was, uh, Tony's niece was on the phone. And, uh, and I had heard and I, I, that nobody talks to Tony or anything. And I, that was fine with me because I had other work I was doing as far as writing goes. And uh, Ruthie said, Michael wants to talk to you. So I got on the phone, and uh, Tony said, Ruthie says you're OK, which meant Just like this? <laughs> <laughs> you're OK. So you know, in other words, we can trust you. And I said, well, you know, he said, well, why, don't, why don't you come over? And I said, OK, I'll, I'll do that. And I thought I'd stay there an hour, maybe see what came about. And Before we go this far, how much access did Tony, Tony lived with Frank, he yes. started out with him as a kid, mm -hmm. he lived with them, saw all the women that he was with, you know, saw President Kennedy elected at Hyannis, he was there for all of this, Yes. everything. So you start to talk to Tony, and mm -hmm. he starts to trust you, and then what happens? The stories just come? Well, the first night I figured we were going to see each other, talk a while, for an hour and then I'll head back home but he keeps bringing more photos out and historical documents and letters from uh, Kennedy's secretary uh, which are in the book or, that's right copies of the letters are in the book and uh, he said oh yeah oh, is that, I didn't I didn't show you all the things you got to come back so I came back a couple of weeks later and we we just had a sort of casually talked about so you things. were gaining his trust as you went. Yeah, but not really intending to because I didn't have an aim of putting a book together. Uh, first of all, uh, Sinatra, I, I love him, but I had no idea. I thought, gee, there's so many Sinatra books out there. Right. But this would, this would be unique because this is first person singular. Tony played hooky with Sinatra in Hoboken <laughs> and knew him from even before he was a singer. So. Tony was an exceptional source, but over a period of time, he said, oh, you, you know, Frank uh, didn't want me uh, to say anything about certain things, but there are certain things I, I could talk about, and so I, I like to tell you about some stories about Dean and Frank and Let's talk things. about Dean. So Tony tells you, and, and I'd heard for years, that Dean never had anything to drink. Right. And Tony says, what about that? Oh, well, Tony says uh, everybody had a, a nickname. Uh, in the Rat Pack, and uh, Dean Martin's was shot glass. So he did drink. Oh, he did drink. Yeah, yeah. And we even talk about one time when uh, Jeannie can't find her husband uh, Dean, and uh, she goes upstairs uh, to Frank's uh, uh, apartment, and Dean is taking a shower, but he's dressed. He was half in the bag. Probably. <laughs> yeah. So why is it that Tony? in his young days, decided to glom on to Frank, to live vicariously, to do his dirty work in some instances when he mm -hmm. wanted to dump women. Let's, whatever, let's put it whatever. That way. What right. was it about Tony that decided, I'm going to go for this ride with Frank Sinatra? Well, I think it all starts with their childhood and playing hooky. In and, and, and uh, you know, because Tony cause, gets kicked out of school in New Haven, and Frank gets kicked out of school because he and some friends bought some pigeons for twenty-five cents and had a high school play uh, about Cleopatra. They let the pigeons fly, and in those days, there was not. Oh, we're worried about uh, that the student psyche. No, they threw you out. You're not behaving, and out you go. So there are these two people wandering around 
going over Horn and Hard Art and having a 15 cent lunch, uh, which would include two hot chocolates and a, a, a French roll. And then they'd go to the movies and sit in the nosebleed sections and watch movies like Blue Skies with Bing Crosby, 1935, way back. And Frank would say, oh, God, I want to be like him. That's what I want to do. And Tony would say, yeah, sure, Frank. Yeah, you're going to make it. Yeah. He said, and Tony said, I, I never thought he would do it. But slowly, Frank uh, left the uh, Brooklyn uh, Navy Yard. He was a reporter briefly. He had thoughts about becoming a professional boxer because his father had been one briefly. And eventually gets into music. And the rest is history. But along the way, lots of things happen. Oh, yeah. Tony tells you stories that you put in this book about the two of them used to go to gay bars. Explain that. Well, those, Tony was really shocked uh, the first time he went. There was one called the Ha Ha Club in New York. And Tony uh, went with Frank a, a lot of places when he wasn't out with a particular woman or so forth. And uh, Tony started looking at one of the singers and boy, she, She's beautiful. And uh, Frank says, pay attention to the Adam's apple. Frank liked to go to these bars because yeah. he said there's such talent here. There, were, there, were, there was great talent. And un, people without a, a, a way of uh, getting that talent out anywhere. So there were a number of illegal gay bars. And there was a, absolutely some wonderful talent. Frank Sinatra was all-inclusive, and when it came to Sammy Davis Jr. and African Americans, he was a great help. Mm -hmm. Tell me what Tony told you about, about that period of time. Well, Frank knew uh, Sammy Davis uh, way back in 1949, and in those days in Vegas, uh, if you were a black musician, if you were Count Basie, or Nat King Cole, or Duke Ellington, well, you could perform in the club, but you couldn't hang around the lounge afterward, and you couldn't sleep in any of the hotels in that particular area, whether it was the Stardust, or the Frontier, or the Sands. So Frank really started paying attention to that with Sammy. He said, well, where are you going? He said, well, we go to some other out of town where we sleep. So Frank went to management and said, well, here's the deal. If, if Sammy can perform here, but he can't sleep here, I'm through. I'm done. I'm, I'll just pack it up. I don't need it. Uh, but if, if you allow Sammy and uh, the, uh, Bill Basie to perform here uh, and stay here, then that's fine. He was powerful enough that he could start doing that. Yeah. And he was, oh, yeah. And he was an excellent friend. You also write in the book about Tony spray painting Frank's... Head. Can you explain this story? <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, the latter part of Frank's life, he wore toupees from the... Boy, oh, and some of them weren't so great. No, no. <laughs> no, 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 they weren't. So th it's at this point in 1951, Fra Frank is really self-conscious about bowing to the audience because he shows his bald spot. And he's ready, ready to quit. Uh, he's having a talk with Bing Crosby. Bean Crosby has just come back from Bermuda and is at the Fountain Blue visiting Frank. And Frank said, gee, Bing, you know, I've got this problem. And uh, I'm, I'm just embarrassed by it. Well, uh, Bing said, well, I wear a toupee. Jack Benny wears a toupee. Bob Hope wears a toupee. George Burns wears a toupee. Just get a toupee. And Frank said, no, I'm, I'm, I'm too young. I just don't want to do that. And it was Joey Bishop who came up with the, not the idea, but the information that there's a spray <laughs> that you can spray on your head and you can uh, therefore cover up the, it doesn't look like you have a bald spot. So when he bowed, he wouldn't see shiny. Exactly. What was it about Tony that stayed with Frank? What, what was it about this relationship when you interviewed him beginning in 2000? Why did he stay? Why did he want this front row seat to this mega star? What, what was going on there? Tony was a unique man. He genuinely loved people. And whatever, even people who needed a job in New Haven, 
not necessarily well known or even known in any way. He'd go out of his way to find work for, jobs for them. And so with, with Frank, he just loved Frank and whatever Frank, he, the way he saw friendship was, if you were a friend, you, whatever that, that friend wants, you do it, even though you don't want to do it. But certainly he must have given up a lot to be on the road, to be with Frank, to do what Frank wanted, to, as, as we talked about, do some of the dirty work that Frank wanted him to do. There must have been times where he thought, what am I doing? Well, there are some, there are some moments where, for instance, uh, one time uh, Tony's uh, spraying Frank's head. Frank has the paper over his eyes. Uh, Sam Giancana comes in. Uh, uh, a, a mob guy. A mob guy from, from Chicago who was known as Dr. Brown at the, at the Fountain Blue. And uh, he says, hello, hi, Frank. Frank looks up. Tony sprays Frank in the face with the brown spray. And Frank said, you're fired. Here's $400. Get out of here. And so there were times when I, Frank uh, fired Tony. But about three hours later, Tony was still down the down in the hotel lobby and Sam comes down and said, what are you doing down here? Frank fired me and I don't know what to do. And he said, Get back upstairs. Did Frank pay him all these years? No. He just had a front row seat to this stardom. Yeah. Well, he calls himself the America's guest because if uh, he needed a suit, he'd go to the hotel, uh, to, to whatever shop was there and get a new suit. Uh, anytime he wanted dinner. It was all, he signed TC for FS, Tony Consiglio for Frank Sinatra. And they'd give the bill to uh, uh, the hotel manager or the, the club manager, and they would take care of it. Interesting life. When he, when you finished up with Tony, were you amazed by these stories? And some of the things that he told you, you said you would not write. Yes, but you that's know true. some stories. Oh, yeah, sure. He was so true to Frank that he said, I'm going to take some of these stories to my grave. Yes, he did. Yeah. And, and of course, the reason for that was because Tony had this remarkable belief that he, be he believed in the, that concept of heaven, that you go back there and you see people. And he was really afraid that... If he, when he got to heaven, he'd see Frank, and Frank would say, I told you not to say, tell those stories. And he said, and Tony said, I don't want any problems when I got to heaven. And he literally believed that, you know. When the book came out, and it's been out a while now, anything you wish you would have put in there that you didn't? No, actually, uh, uh, it's very tight. I'm, I'm glad we got in some of the clarifications uh, uh, about Frank's music about the personalities of uh, Dean Martin and uh, uh, Sammy Davis Jr. and so forth. And, and the whole idea was to write about why people admired that, that group and why were they so much fun. And that's what we put in a lot of that book. So it's not a, a tell-all kind of thing. It's, it's just really trying It's to living the life through Tony. Yeah. Yeah, and Tony was a wonderful man. We should say that you're a very prolific writer, Franz. You've got four more books coming out. Right. Elvis is out there, which is, you're saying, you're, you're talking to a bunch of people, a biography. Yes, biography, right. Uh, a novel called Dear Abby, right. one called Deja Vu, right. and finally, one called 1968. Yes. A history of a year. That was a powerful year. Well, I, I just considered that year was one that changed American culture more than any other between the assassinations and uh, elections and all the things that we had going on then. And it was a, a tumultuous time. Everybody thinks the 60s, oh, the peaceful, loving 60s. I never felt that during the 60s, and I certainly don't feel it that way now. Tumultuous time. Franz, thank you so much for writing this book. Lots of pictures in there, lots of information that we didn't know before, and I had fun reading it. I had fun writing it. Thanks you so know. much for coming on. Thank you for having me. Great seeing you.